This is Call the Psychiatrist, the show where psychiatrists answer your questions. I'm Dr. David Handley. And I'm Dr. Abby Snavely. On today's episode, we'll be talking about boundaries as we discuss the hit podcast and now television miniseries, The Shrink Next Door. Say you like me, you better count the ways. Okay, so before we get started with The Shrink Next Door, I have a, a few updates to go over. So our production schedule is now close to real time. So we can actually say Happy New Year, at least if you're listening to it in January. Um, our earlier episodes were recorded even before we had a trailer out. And so just wanted to take a second to thank everyone who's listened, and especially the people that have given us some feedback. So our, And ask questions. That's right. We need more. Mm-hmm. Um, in real life, I got in the way of our production schedule this week, and we can thank COVID for that. Thanks, COVID. Um, so one thing I've learned since our podcast came out is that a lot of people I know don't listen to podcasts. <laughs> um, so there's a few things that are new. Now you can follow us on social media. There's an Instagram and a Facebook page, and that's at Call the Psychiatrist. There's also a private community group on Facebook, and we would love to see that start to grow. Now, if you've seen any of our pictures on social media, you'll see that I am all about the merchandise. And that I'm not trying to sell you merchandise. I just love to have merchandise. And that's actually one of my big motivations for even having a podcast. Um, but that being said, we do have some small, like two by two inch square stickers of our amazing unicorn that we'd love to give away. So if you would send us a question or even just a topic that you'd like to hear us discuss, or if you join our Facebook community group, or just do the email sign up on our website, we would love to send you one of these stickers. So if you do those things, we'll message you, see if you want a sticker, and if so, where should we send it? All right, so let's move on to feedback and follow-ups from the last episode. That was the Hidden Valley Road episode. Uh, The only thing I noticed is that nobody criticized our criticism of the book, which I was a little surprised because everybody loves the book, apparently, except for us. Um, But I assume as the audience gets bigger, we'll get hate mail. So everybody was quiet so far. I think that's how we will know that we made it is if we start to get hate mail or enemies, right? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about um, you? Yeah, do you have feedback from the last time? So one of our big criticisms of Hidden Valley Road was that it was not a very accurate portrayal of schizophrenia and did not include much from the actual patients with these psychotic disorders. So hopefully to be more helpful and positive, I would like to recommend two books, both written by women with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, respectively. The first is The Center Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness by Ellen Sachs. This book came out in 2007. She is a USC law professor who also has an excellent TED Talk about her experiences with schizophrenia, with mental illness, starting from the age of eight all the way through her prestigious education, hospitalizations, psychoanalysis, Um, It's pretty directly written, but pretty intimate. And I think that Dr. Sachs does a really nice job of describing. And it seems like she has a really good emotional memory for what it is like to have psychosis and for uh, some of her experiences. The second book uh, came out in 2019. It's called The Collected Schizophrenias by Esme Wang. This is another personal account. It is a collection of essays She talks a lot about her own experience, but also has some political and social commentary, talking about education and media, her own marriage, her thoughts about motherhood. This is a really, another, I guess, complex and nuanced portrayal. I think both of these are great. They are definitely exceptional women who are very well-educated and intelligent. And so some people might say, well, this isn't representative of everyone, but I do think each book is a pretty unique look into what someone's life is like living with some of these symptoms. And I think it's just really helpful to have some personal narratives of psychotic illnesses. This sound great. I'll, uh, I'll make sure I yep. put links in the, in the show notes if anybody wants to check those out. Thanks, Dave. But now let's get to today's episode. Uh, Like you said, we want to talk about boundaries. But first, I was hoping that you could kind of summarize the shrink next door, or at least the the podcast phase of this story. Yeah, I'm going to give a rundown on the podcast. And then I fear later we can talk about the TV show because it's so much less factual. 
and far inferior. <laughs> right. I just you know, if people are here for <laughs> listen, if people are here for the criticism, I just want to, you know, give them a You're little ready. teaser. That's all. Okay. That's I'm ready. Okay. All right. Well, so the give the people what they want. Yeah. So the podcast was released by Wondery in 2019. It's written and narrated by the journalist Joe Nocera, uh, and he's worked for the New York Times and I think more recently with Bloomberg. So this journalist buys a vacation home in the South Hamptons, and he gets invited over to a neighbor's house. The gathering is hosted by a psychiatrist, Dr. Isaac Hirschkopf. And by all appearances, this is Hirschkopf's house. Um, Only later does the journalist learn that the guy who appeared to be the caretaker of the house, Marty Markowitz, is the actual owner, and Dr. Hirschkopf is Marty's psychiatrist. So over the course of the show, we learn that Marty started seeing Ike for therapy for depression and anxiety in 1981. Over the 29-year relationship they had, Marty surrendered more and more of his life over to Ike. Uh, Dr. Hirschkopf became the president of Marty's company, although he used a pseudonym in that role so that others wouldn't know that he was Marty's psychiatrist. The psychiatrist became a joint owner of Marty's Swiss bank account, valued at that time at $920,000. They started a nonprofit foundation funded almost exclusively by Marty, but as partners, Ike was able to write checks on the account, including checks he wrote to himself. Um, Marty changed his will so that his estate would be donated to this foundation and made Ike the executor of the will and this power of attorney. So basically his entire fortune would have been controlled by Ike, except his house in the Hamptons, which he willed to Ike's wife. And so as I said earlier, um, Ike and his family took over the house in the Hamptons to go on vacation. They threw big parties. Marty was responsible for executing the plans for the party. Uh, when they were there, um, Ike and his wife used the master bedroom. Ike changed the name on the mailbox to a pseudonym, uh, Isaac Stevens. Marty spent hundreds of hours doing uncompensated secretarial duties for Ike, including typing his book manuscripts and confidential correspondence for his medical practice. And then finally, Marty blamed Ike for orchestrating a split from his sister and keeping him isolated from other people in his life. So Marty finally ends a relationship in 2010. Um, We're told in the podcast that he didn't have a malpractice claim because of a statute of limitations, but Marty registered many complaints with the New York Medical Board. It looks like just from a timing standpoint that because the podcast brought out so much public attention to the case, uh, the Department of Health finally pursued an investigation. So it's just another example of the power of podcasting. Kind of makes me think we should probably, yeah, we should probably aim our goals a little higher. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so the podcast also has two other patients of Dr. Hirschkopf's. Uh, one of these patients appears in the medical board documents. Uh, this was a woman who saw him from 1985 to 2003. Among other things, he let her donate lots of money to his foundation, and she made his children the sole heirs of her will. So these are the allegations that were investigated over the course of the podcast. Um, Marty is described in the show as a pretty serious pack rat who saved everything, every receipt, every photo, every memento, so that when his complaints were finally investigated by the Department of Health, the state board held a five-member committee hearing. So Dr. Hirschkopf had legal counsel present, witnesses testified, including cross-examination, evidence was reviewed. In other words, it sounds like he had due process. The committee concluded in April of 2021 that Dr. Hirschkopf was in violation of all 16 charges brought by the state including gross negligence, incompetence, exercising undue influence, fraudulent practice, and moral unfitness. And as a result, he had to surrender his medical license. So Hirschkopf's defense during the hearing was that early in the relationship with Marty, he stopped being a psychiatrist and became a business consultant. He also said that psychiatric ethics in the 80s didn't prevent a doctor from having a social or business relationship with a patient. And now in the podcast, Joe Nacero reported Hirschkopf is saying that the allegations were false and pointed to the fact that Marty had a law degree from NYU and was a graduate of the Wharton School. So how could such a smart guy like him be so easily influenced or taken advantage of? The hearing panel said that throughout the proceedings, Hirschkopf, quote, showed little insight or remorse, often portraying himself as a victim, end quote. Now, I just kind of reviewed the facts by the medical board. Uh, Marty goes over a lot more detail over the course of the podcast that are even more cringeworthy and you're going to want to hear the whole thing, but I stuck to the facts that that were at least founded by the, by the board. So we're not getting into other allegations. So this is a good drama. I mean, when I first heard about this podcast, I had no interest in listening to it though. Um, I immediately discounted it. I thought it was probably sensationalized, probably one-sided, but I decided to listen because of the TV show 
and I was hooked after the first episode. Um, I had no defense for the psychiatrist after after the first episode. But um, Abby, you were reluctant to listen too, right? I was. I think maybe a little bit like you. I just I had no interest. I had people in my life, patients, friends talk about it. And I just sort of thought I do not need to watch or I guess in this case, listen to another piece of media with a villain psychiatrist or, you know, I get some some old idea about the doctor being crazier than the patient. But you are right. It uh, It is quite a tale. And they do the, the podcast is excellent. And it does a much better job than we will do, obviously, of telling the story with all of these juicy details. Um, but I do think that, you know, hopefully today we can talk with some, I don't know, maybe just nuance or, or approaching it from a different perspective. And I think one of the things I like about the podcast is that it doesn't really dig so far into the, the past or the histories of these, of these men to try to explain it. But, um, and, and we won't explain it either. And I know Dave, you'll get to that. But I think if we can talk about the, the boundaries, the boundaries that were violated here, and then maybe how we think about these things, it might be a fun discussion. Yeah, because, you know, the the common question that I got about the podcast was, you know, what's wrong with Marty Markowitz that he would allow something like this to happen to him? And I have a lot of theories about that, but it's not appropriate oh, sure. for us to publicly talk about him because these are all real life people in the public eye and we've never examined any of them. Um, and I'm going to argue there's actually a better question that we should ask, um, which is kind of what mm-hmm. you were alluding to. But before I get to that, I want to give a little bit of history because it's probably going to tell me about the gold water rule. Dave, uh, yes, please. it's going to come up in future episodes. So I just want to go and get everybody informed. You know, mm-hmm. I got a little bit of positive feedback about my history tangents and that's all I need. Right. I mean, it's From just who? I'm not going to say. OK. All right. <laughs> but, you know, the, the it just people. lit my fire. Um, I'm. I would, Good. Can I get like a chime? I feel like I should have like a like harp like a harp thing. If I find one, I'm going to put it in right here. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, there need there is some there is a segment here. There is a recurring segment. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to just it will embrace re- it. Reveal itself with yeah. time. So yes, insert sound effect now. Great. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right. The 1964 <laughs> presidential campaign: Barry Goldwater versus Lyndon Johnson. The editors of Fact Magazine. <laughs> Come on. The editors of Fact Magazine. Fact magazine. I'm with you. I'm with you. I am smiling ear to ear. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Okay, okay start so again. They, I will not laugh so loudly. They sent a survey to over 12,000 psychiatrists asking, quote, do you believe Barry Goldwater is psychologically fit to serve as president of the United States? Now, the questionnaire also had information about Goldwater's personal history, including a statement about, quote, nervous breakdowns. Um, obviously, they were trying to prime the pump. So the survey had less than a 20% response rate. And then in that small group of responders, half said he was either fit or there wasn't enough information and half said he was unfit. But some of them didn't say he was just unfit because there was clearly there was a comment section. (laughs) So I have a couple of my favorites, uh, if you'll indulge me. All right, all right. Uh, Quote, a megalomaniacal grandiose omnipotence appears to pervade Mr. Goldwater's personality, giving further evidence of his denial and lack of recognition of his own feelings of insecurity and ineffectiveness. I mean, burn. I had 1960s burn, right? <laughs> I'm saying. I don't think you. No, that's that's. Mm-hmm. I don't think yeah, you get all ahead. that on a tweet. I mean, I don't have any characters. <laughs> Correct. And then one more uh, quote from his published statements. I get the impression that Goldwater is basically a paranoid schizophrenic who decompensates from time to time. Well, as as we talked about last week, nobody knows what that means, right? I mean, why not? Everybody is schizophrenic. Yeah, because the last episode we talked about the overdiagnosis of schizophrenia in this era. And I mean, here you go. And that was, I just pulled out too. I mean, a lot of them, yeah, called him a schizophrenic. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So the American Psychiatric Association, they were embarrassed. They denounced the survey. They tried to get the magazine from running the story because it was ridiculous. The American Medical Association was furious because they were endorsing Goldwater and all their lobbyists were working on his campaign. And then, of course, Goldwater was furious and he uh, successfully sued the magazine and its editor. So then the AMA was so mad at the APA, so that's the... Medical Association mad at the kooky psychiatrist that in 1973, the APA adopted Section 7.3 in the Principles of Medical Ethics with annotations especially applicable to psychiatry, which says, and I'm paraphrasing, don't talk about people you don't know. 
what we now call the gold player <laughs> rule, um, which is actually a pretty I good mean, rule. like gossip, but don't diagnose. Well, it, yeah, they, they reinforced the rule uh, in 2017 to make it sound like mm-hmm. if you're going to gossip, don't call yourself a psychiatrist before you gossip. Um, right. Although some have, yeah, the, some just sort of interpret. People it broke this around Trump. They did. Yeah. So uh, 2017, Dr. Bandy Lee at Yale and several of her colleagues published a book. They clearly broke the rule. Um, the title was something like duty to warn. So if anybody's heard of the Goldwater rule before today, I'm guessing you you remember it from the last presidential administration. But I still think in general, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a lesson from kindergarten, you know, don't talk about people. So we're, we're going to, we're going to stick to that, but that doesn't mean we're limited. I, I think we're going to have a better discussion. I don't think we need to try to diagnose these people. I think we can talk about what happened. Agreed. Yeah. So, I, th- so I think the more compelling question here is what is the nature of psychotherapeutic relationship that lends itself to the kind of exploitation described in the podcast or really to any kind of exploitation? Or in another way, why is it so easy to have these boundary violations? Well, so maybe we should talk about what what we think boundaries are. I mean, I think this is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Maybe what the psychotherapeutic boundaries or the doctor-patient relationship boundaries I mean, I think even that claim that Dr. Ike was making that he could stop being Marty's psychiatrist and start being a business advisor um, is something that I think is, is pretty, is pretty dubious. I mean, from the beginning, it seemed like Dr. Ike didn't hold up anything. What didn't hold up the frame is what um, I would call it, or a lot of therapists would call it in terms of their interactions happening at the office, their interactions happening during a specific time and date. I know that, um, you know, Dr. Ike is giving Marty lots of advice. I mean, there is there is this old fashioned idea of a psychoanalytic tradition or what you would see in a New Yorker cartoon where the the therapist, the psychiatrist is being completely silent while the patient is lying on the couch and looking away from them. It's meant to portray the idea that this that the therapist is completely abstinent and that there is no part of themselves uh, that's enter- entering into the therapy. So if the patient's not looking at the doctor and the doctor's not saying anything and the patient's just free associating, that is, I mean, that is one type of ideal. People will talk about being a blank screen or the therapist being a blank slate on which onto which the patient can project his or her fantasies and ideas. And um, there can be some use to that, but that's also, mm, that's one end of the spectrum. And then the Ike and Marty situation is on the other end of the spectrum. And so part of what I think maybe is interesting is where modern or current practice is in the middle and, and where we might choose to cross these boundaries or put more of ourselves in there, or even when we don't choose it, when parts of our lives enter into the therapeutic relationship and kind of what to do about that. So what I will talk about first is why I think having these boundaries is important. I think that it can provide for the patient and for the therapist, but we'll focus on the patient first, um, a sense of safety, some predictability, a sense of respect in that, you know, a patient can come to my office and know that hopefully I'm going to be on time. We start on time. We end on time. During that time, they hopefully feel safe and free to talk about what they want to. They also know that there's going to be an end time during which they get to leave, that they can go and live the rest of their life without me interfering with that. Um, And, you know, and that, that our roles are defined. And so I think one of the things that got tricky for these two men is all of the dual relationships that they had, right? Not only was, you know, Dr. Ike in his business and telling him what to do with his sister and in his finances, but he was giving him dating advice and kind of inner, well, I would say interfering, but, you know, interjecting himself into all of these issues, which I think ultimately doesn't respect the patient or his autonomy. And, you know, not that, not to say that, good treatments can't go on for a very long period of time. But I think the fact that, you know, Marty remained dependent on his psychiatrist for 30 years and never um, 
went out kind of on his own speaks to some of the dangers of that. Are there other ways that you think about kind of holding boundaries in like that that more concrete sense or why you might or might not want to keep the relationship totally in the room? No, I, I keep coming back to ideally, if possible, it should always it should always be in the room. It, that may not be yeah. That may not be plausible, uh, especially now mm-hmm. in the age of social media, uh, psychiatrists doing podcasts. Um, <laughs> like, there's a lot right. of times when there are disclosures that happen unintentionally. Um, but I think mm-hmm. when those happen, it, I mean, you could argue that it weakens the treatment. Um, and then, mm-hmm. you know, I guess there's the other side that says, well, but you're human and, and all of this should be more transparent. Again, if you look at some people on social media, you, you clearly, yeah, I mean, they, they clearly put it all out there, inviting their patients into their most intimate moments. But even without that, you know, because I, I guess I will often hear, you know, um, a little bit of a pushback or someone saying, you know, well, how I'm here telling you everything about myself, Dr. Schnabley, and you know, I don't know anything about you, which, you know, is not necessarily true. Um, even, even without social media, which we should definitely come back to, you know, they know what I look like. They know what I sound like. They know what my office looks like. Uh, they might know if I am injured or pregnant, they might, uh, Google me and find out other information about me online that, you know, is, there's a, and plus all the things that are just, for lack of a better uh, phrase, like vibe, right? I mean, that there is an energy between people where you can get to know them, know their sense of humor, know how they think about things without knowing every detail of someone's life. But maybe now more than ever, but I think always the idea that the therapist would withhold something or withhold information can be really uncomfortable for some people. Yeah. And, you know, I back to your the pushback of I don't know anything about you. Yeah. You know, the intention is not to be mysterious. It's because, yeah, this isn't like a friendship. I mean, we have a real relationship and one where I hope a person feels cared for. Um, but, you know, I, I always imagine, like, I guess when I'm describing that uh, to somebody, imagine if mm-hmm. if you did have a potential friendship and you walked up to that person and immediately expected them to divulge as much private information as possible without, without you divulging it. Right. (laughs) Like that wouldn't go anywhere. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think the rule of thumb is if you go see a therapist and you know more about your therapist than they know about you after a session or two, there's a problem. Absolutely. That's the, that's the breakup with your, with your therapist time. Um, but that, that you, you know, that we can also, also learn a lot about people, um, based on, what they imagine about us, right? I mean, that that I think sometimes answering a question, often answering a question quickly that someone has can foreclose learning more about that patient or exploring what the answer might mean to them. Um, and that it's very normal, natural, expected, even helpful for someone to wonder about their therapist. But, you know, I guess the process is at least as important, probably more important than the content of that answer. Yeah. And, and the curiosity is is normal. I mean, and it's okay to, of course. to be curious and to talk about the curiosity. I, I remember when training, it was like such a big deal if you're going to wear your wedding ring because now you've communicated something mm-hmm. um, that may not be overt and that may have some meaning for the patient that you don't know about yet. I guess I, I worry we're getting into some gobbledygook, but <laughs> um, well, maybe if you describe... You know, we're, we're talking about a specific kind of therapy, obviously. Um, although I would yes. argue that this happens, I think, with any doctor-patient relationship or a therapist-patient relationship. You're right. So I'm talking about psychodynamic or psychoanalytic therapy in which I have been trained, where if someone asks me a question about myself, I am going to be very curious about, again, their fantasies. What do they think? What's behind the question? I still might answer it if, uh, after we talk about it, the um, that seems like it would be helpful. But you're right. I mean, in different types of therapy, I think people might feel more comfortable or, you know, a CBT therapist might not be looking for the the transference fantasy in someone's question. At the same time, to your point, if the therapist spends too much time talking about themselves, then that's a problem 
regardless. Right. Well, talk a little bit about the fantasy. I mean, um, I, I can think of a lot yeah. of examples where, you know, I think mm-hmm. patients often see me in a very fatherly role, maybe depending on the age difference, mm-hmm. maybe it's a brother, um, you know, maybe it's mm-hmm. an idealized romantic partner that um, absolutely that needs to be explored because in that ideal state, you know, they don't know where I put my dirty clothes, right? I mean, in the ideal state, you know, here I am as an empathic individual who wants to take care of them and exploring that Mm -hmm. can be helpful for the person to understand maybe what they're struggling with. Yeah, absolutely. And in a certain way, it's probably if someone comes in and is idealizing you, that may be, you know, actually very helpful to them, right? I mean, if you say, no, 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 you know, my, my house is a mess and I never do my laundry either, that, you know, if they are needing someone to look up to, that's not necessarily very helpful, right? Right, right. I can think of, you know, vacations is a, is a good example, um, you know, and, and again, in certain circumstances, it could be totally appropriate or therapeutic even to tell someone where you're going on vacation. But I can think of someone who for a long time, for years, anytime I would go on vacation, their fantasy was that I was going to go somewhere, maybe to the mountains by myself and read books about psychiatry during my time off and then, you know, come back rested and like better educated and I would say better able to help them with their issues. Right. So they couldn't tolerate and then, you having other relationships outside of the, correct. the relationship they have with you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No other relationships, no fun, no hobbies, <laughs> right? No where they had never been, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And then over time, I don't, I don't think there was ever room for the whole family, but maybe friends. But that, that told me a lot more about that person's inner life and their relationship to me. You know, maybe things that they were envious of or, um, or, or just really needing to, you know, to believe in probably a helpful way that I, that I existed to help them. Um, and whereas if they said, where are you going on vacation? And I was like, I'm going to the beach with my kids and my friend, right? Like that, that's a, that's a totally different, that's a totally different scenario. And whether I think in some ways it could be harmful to admit something like that, but at the very least, I think I would have learned a lot less about them and what some of their underlying fears were if, if we hadn't had those conversations. It would have been such a missed opportunity. I just thought of an example that might be clear for people. So I have someone who was insistent that they know nothing about me because if they Mm -hmm. knew anything about me, they might care about me. And if Mm -hmm. they care about me, then ultimately, like everyone else, I would hurt them. I would abandon them eventually. Yeah. And again, Mm -hmm. without having the frame, without having that difference in this kind of relationship, we wouldn't have been able to explore that. Mm-hmm. Without being without being open to the idea that the relationship we have is fair game and that it will only get muddied the more that blank slate is, you know, is written on. I know I mentioned pregnancy. I think that is a, uh, it's a very interesting state, right? On one hand, with some folks, I felt like I was wearing a sign that said I had sex, uh, which was maybe a, you know, an, an idea. Let, I was going to say an image, but well, I'll back I'll back that up and say an idea that maybe you know that maybe people didn't want to have, um, and that that's not something that could be hidden after a while, and that was an involuntary disclosure, if you will, but that you know letting people sort of associate to it, they maybe did have feelings about you know sibling rivalry or about their mothers, but even about their own sexualities. I mean, I remember a patient who had a whole scenario in their mind about my same-sex partner and all the trouble we would have to go to to get a sperm donor and all of this information, which again, was would have been very different than when I said, well, you know, guess what? My husband and I are super excited for this baby. Um, And so, you know, I think there are things that enter in like that involuntarily or that they find out uh, through through other means um, that that don't have to do just with what we're disclosing. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if there's a difference for you with that living in a smaller town um, 
where it's probably much harder to avoid that extra therapeutic input. Yeah, it is because I'm, you know, seen in the public. I mean, in a, in a large city, you might run into your psychiatrist, but in a small town, you're almost certainly going to or, or see me, you know, yeah. being just a human disheveled. Mm-hmm. You know, um, right. with my family. So now talk about like all the disclosure that just happened now. Like I may not talk about them in session, but now suddenly you've witnessed sure. it. And so I think it complicates it. But I guess what I've learned is that as long as all parties are fine with discussing it, it tends to be okay. Um, you know, to yeah, find out like this is my this is when I need my heart music of like, yeah, you just have to talk about right, it. Right, right. Cause so as long as we can revisit and say, what was that like for you? I mean, like, did that feel uncomfortable? Mm-hmm. Did I feel like I was invading your mm-hmm. space because we ran each other, you know, in the aisle in the grocery store? Did that suddenly now feel, you know, unsafe or or something else? Or did it change the relationship we have? I mean, you know, you don't want to talk things to death because I that's almost a a trope or something. Yeah, you don't want to satirize yourself. Yeah, right, right. I mean, like the whole. So I've got to tell you, I, I mean, a long time ago, I ran into my therapist at a bar and I about fell off my stool. It <laughs> because was, you were drunk it or was, because you saw your therapist? Um, both. <laughs> both. I should not be drunk with this old man near me. I did not know what was happening. It was out of context. It was, it rattled me. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I just, I've been on both sides of it, but that one, that one I can talk about. And then it's like, I don't know. It was, it was, <laughs> and and we talked about it for a long time. Um, but it was weird. I wasn't, I wasn't drunk yet. I think it probably really, uh, sped things up for me on that night. Yeah, but I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Which I think that, do. I think that brings up a really good point. So you brought up your own therapist. Um, Yeah. I think it's important for people who are in this job to understand just how vulnerable a position the patient is in. Um, right. and, I, and I can, you know, I can tie that back to Marty. I mean, Marty, in his narrative, you know, had struggled. He'd gone through a lot. His parents had died. He had taken over this company. Mm-hmm. There was an uncle that was trying to usurp the authority. A girlfriend just broke up with him. I mean, this is just what he said in the podcast. I'm not. Um, right. But he also said that when he went to the psychiatrist, it was really helpful initially. Mm-hmm. And he talked about how idealized he saw Dr. Hirschkopf. You know, he he described him as being just so handsome and charismatic and so smooth with the ladies. I mean, all of the things that he wanted for himself. Now, again, you can argue, though, that, I mean, to other people, I don't think they would have seen that. But that was right. the that was the projection that, that Marty had. That was the image. Yeah, that was and his the, And that they had... This guy was on his team, right? I think their Jewishness or their shared Jewishness was a big part of this story too. Um, in terms of there was enough things to hook on to where he could see the, the doctor as an aspirational figure, maybe a big brother, you know, or at least a cool kid that he got to, you know, be with and have on his team, which does feel good, right? I mean, someone who you admire in any way, you know, liking you, paying attention to you, spending time with you, trying to help you. Of course, that's going to feel good and be helpful, at least at the start. At the start. And, you know, even at the end of the podcast, Marty still seems ambivalent. I mean, so he's angry because he's been hurt and he's sure. angry, but he'll still lapse into the good things. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you can tell he's torn, uh, like maybe putting in that miniature golf Put put course behind the house was a good idea. He's not sure. I mean, sure. Uh, the hurt is there, or maybe it was just worth it, right? And yeah. that, well, and and so you're right. I think that he came in vulnerable, but I think it's also fair to assume that they did have a real friendship that turned exploitative. Maybe it always was. Um, they it, there's always a real relationship in in addition to the therapeutic relationship, but I think part of it is about you know, again, recognizing maybe the power differential or the vulnerability, but to be able to say, you know, the therapeutic relationship comes first. And if these other things are going to threaten that, then we really need to think twice. Yeah. I was just thinking how it got so out of hand. Um, so they, we'll talk about the, the TV show later. They speculate about mm-hmm. Dr. Hirschkopf and his motivation. Actually, they don't speculate much. They just make him a 
more one dimensional villain, but he's just a villain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they assume he though has a lot of intention um, or that he's motivated mm-hmm. by money. That, that was one thing that was clear. And mm-hmm. I don't know that that's true. My argument against that is um, I'm trying to stick to facts. Uh, there's a photograph um, mm-hmm. where the psychiatrist is in his bathing suit and there are three women all in bathing suits. There's physical contact between the three, the four of them. Uh, those were all mm-hmm. his patients or had been patients or right. were current patients. So, so there was something that, that was feeding him that, that he was getting, not just money. Um, I right. mean, he was, there's the whole thing with celebrities and wanting photographs of them. I mean, there's something. They tried to make that, yeah. Yeah. A big part of it. <laughs> Trying to stick to the facts. Well, but, but I think that the, the implications, whether we know, we, well, not even whether we know, since we don't know the truth, but I feel comfortable saying that the implication though, is that Dr. Ike was getting some of his own needs met, right? Whatever those are. Conscious, not conscious, financial status, fine. I don't know, right? But I also think, you know, he probably had to be charming enough and insightful enough and being able to say things to Marty that rang true. But even from the beginning, Ike says, well, you know, you're easy Mark Markowitz. You're an easy Mark. You're a pushover. I'm going to help you with that. And then somehow at least in the telling of the story, Easy Mark gets pushed over by his doctor as well. There's definitely people that are dependent, right? That people at least will push for you to give them advice. I think often I would say if if advice worked, nobody would be at a therapist or a psychiatrist. That's what Dr. Google and your friends are for. Um, Most of the time it's not a knowledge problem in terms of what to do, but I, you know, I think in this case, well, we should stick to the facts, but, you know, Marty came in to Dr. Ike with all of this confusion in his life. And at least as he's portrayed this very anxious, unsure guy um, who did want somebody to tell him what to do. Um, I, I want to underscore what you just said, because I think it's important and I don't want somebody to miss it. Okay. That therapy is not advice. That that doesn't mean that you may not get some advice when it's appropriate. Sure. Um, because I mean, what we try to do is actually meet the patient where they are and provide whatever interventions that might be most helpful. And there's sometimes when people are really struggling that just some advice is what they need uh, and encouragement. And you know, we might call that more behavioral therapy. And then we might do more cognitive therapy and we're supportive, we're supportive. solution focused. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of different techniques. And we hope that we we go to mm-hmm. the technique that's most appropriate at the time, including advice, but that's not all it is. And and just as you said, if that's all you need, no. I mean, that's the difference in having a friendship and having a therapist. Right. Well, and if advice worked, then I We would have no jobs. I, yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, people could come in, give me a big fat check, and I would say, this is what you should do with your life. Right. And then they would go do like it. If, if and you, then it would be over. It would be right. a one time. It would be right. a one session. Like we would all like have like normal done. body weight if we were just, oh, you should eat healthier. Oh, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. I didn't know. Have you thought of that? You should eat less and exercise more, right? I mean. Yeah. I didn't know I shouldn't eat fruity pebbles all day. Like, right. I had no idea. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So it, it's not advice. And ideally, like in that same way, Right. We're working ourselves out of a job, at least with, you know, an individual patient. And, you know, I don't know that that was ever uh, that didn't seem to be on the horizon for Dr. Ike. It does seem like even when Marty wished to end the relationship, his psychiatrist did not at wish all. that to happen for, for many for, reasons. Yes, I'm for sure. many reasons. I'm, I am also sure. Um, so, yeah. So yeah, we've talked about, you know, the disclosures and some of the reasons for the frame, but I think it could be interesting to talk about different kinds of boundary crossings. I mean, I think of, you know, boundary crossings in that these are things that are outside of the normal parameters or norms set that the therapist and the patient agree upon. Um, These could be things like gift giving, treating other people in the same family, other kinds of dual relationships. I mean, the financial comes up a lot in the shrink next door. More egregiously would be dating or sexual relationships, um, but other social crossover, things like that. Um, I don't know, Dave, do any of those stand out to you? 
Yeah. I mean, the dual relationships comes up for me yeah. now. It used to not be an issue, but because I practice in a small community mm-hmm. and I'm the only in-person psychiatrist for a hundred miles, those are situations where, you know, so I guess the dilemma is, uh, I could see another person in the family and there could be potentially a boundary crossing there, or that person may really struggle to get treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I've done is I always check with the primary patient first. Like, again, it, it really goes back to a lot of open discussion. Yeah. If, if somebody contacts me and I know about it, now it has happened where I hadn't know that there was another relationship. Like I, this person came to me, there's a different last mm-hmm. name. And then I realized like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, um, but you know, I always go back to the primary person who established the relationship and we talk about what it means. And if there's a discomfort there, then I don't, I don't move yeah. forward. Um, you know, ideally oftentimes there's not a discomfort there. At least the person doesn't perceive it initially. And then it's, there's a lot of education, I think around the potential pitfalls. Mm-hmm. Do you ever have a hard time keeping it straight? Like who told you what about the family? Well, and that's something I talk about immediately that I will probably make a mistake. I don't know that I've ever made an egregious mistake. Mm-hmm. I have a pretty good memory right. um, and can compartmentalize. But, you know, there's even some cases where the, at some point it really just becomes more family therapy mm-hmm. and that that alleviates a lot of that burden for me. And it actually, I think, it can become therapeutic, unloading a lot of secrets and becoming more transparent. Sure. Um, not to say that everything becomes transparent, but at least some of the conflicts maybe in a relationship becomes transparent. So those are hard. And I guess selfishly, it may be that I've hired a service and then a couple of weeks later, that person wants to become a patient. And so then now mm-hmm. I have to realize that I can never have that person perform that service for me. And there's not a lot of other people yeah. available. Or I'll meet somebody and I'll think, oh, this might be a friend. Like, you know, this, this might be a relationship worth putting some effort into. And then several weeks later, they want to become a patient. And then I have to think, oh, there goes my opportunity for a friendship. Because to me, it's never both. It cannot be both if I'm going to do a good job. No, it can't be both, right? I mean, to me, it feels impossible to, I don't know, be in friend mode when you're out hiking or whatever, and then be in therapist mode the other time, right? Like, even if you were fine with that person knowing all these things about you, even though I would still maintain that that is not helpful for the therapy. It's like how, I I don't know. I just, I I think that it just seems, it seems too tricky and you're right. Like there is a sacrifice, but I think it's ultimately about safety and respect for the patient. I guess around here in the big city, I have had the opposite experience where I've had patients who I think we would be friends in real life. Um, You know, not always. And sometimes a patient will bring it up or sometimes it's understood. And again, I think you can talk about it and just sort of say, you know, yeah, like in a different life or a different time, you know, we might have been friends or, you know, we do like each other a lot and that's real and we can have a friendly relationship. Right. But always, again, kind of keeping in mind that since this therapeutic relationship came first, this is the one we've got. I think that's a great point. And I think sometimes patients, they want to hear this mm-hmm. and and maybe they're surprised that we actually do genuinely care about them. Right. <laughs> we, we, want them we want them to be better. We 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 celebrate their their wins. We grieve their losses. We think um, about them when they're not there, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. And I think people, yeah, people are sometimes surprised and yet they're always maybe happily surprised mm-hmm. too. I mean, I remember running into a patient at a yoga class and without thinking, we hugged each other. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and she was, and, and, you know, this person was very kind and generous about it. And she's like, no, of course, like we would totally be friends if I wasn't your patient. And in that way, I guess she mm. took care of me. And, you know, later we talked about it and it was fine, but it was like someone that I was genuinely happy and surprised to run into, and I think vice versa, and hugged her like I would hug a friend, even though we had not hugged before or since. Our, our <laughs> yeah, our colleagues think we're like crazy to talk about this. That's stuff, fair. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's like plenty of doctors hug their patients. Right. right? And uh, it's so funny that if it happens to us, then we have to like get tense. And we have to justify <laughs> it. And I'm like, I promise right, I never right, touched I... her again. <laughs> right. Like this, you know. <laughs> 
smart adult woman who has agency. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me I, let me say this though, because I know this can sound. If it's foreign to you, if you've never been a patient or uh-huh. if you're not a therapist, if you haven't been in that relationship, this might sound really weird. Mm-hmm. But I think when you're looking for somebody, you at least hope that they think about this stuff. Yeah. I mean, maybe they're not so crazy and maybe they're not, you know, they don't have to overthink and over explain and, and talk things to death. But you do want somebody who is at least aware of all the things we're talking about because you don't want to end up like Marty. You don't, right? I, you don't want a doctor... Or probably anybody who's just acting how they feel, especially if you come to them in crisis, right? I mean, I I like to be with people at all different times of their life, but usually when you reach out to a psychiatrist, it's not because you're like doing awesome. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> like we. Right. That's a life coach. That's a li- that's we- <laughs> yeah, that's a life coach. That's a life coach. Um, and we. You want to take it to the next level. That's right. Yeah, you want to optimize. I'm here. You want to hack. I'm here to you level wanna, up. Yeah. Like, well, okay. <laughs> right. My life is great, uh-huh. but it needs to be awesome. Right. 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 And then I say, yeah, spending time with me will make it awesome. <laughs> no? um, this is tangential, but what I have sure. discovered in this community is that other physicians have mm-hmm. a lot of dual relationships. And I wonder all the time. Yeah. And I wonder, is that the nature of the medical model, you know, where the relationship is so much more discounted? Um, Mm -hmm. they, they almost take it more as just a transactional, you know, you pay your health premiums. I give you this medication. We can be buds outside. I I don't know. Um, Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I think that there are people who, or I know there are people that don't even think twice about it. I think of someone I know from med school, who's a dermatologist who gets jewelry from their patients, right? Like, 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 okay. Um, Just for payment or just as a tip? No, just as like a tip, like Merry Christmas. And, you know, and, and people, you know, I, I have accepted gifts. Um, and it's tough because if someone gives you a gift, you want, you know, as a, as a good psychoanalyst type person, I want to talk about it at the same time. I want to be human. I don't want to say I can't accept this and have it feel like a rejection or, something else. I mean, there's, I don't know, maybe we, maybe this is too in the weeds and there's some things about what it means or what it costs or things like that. So, so when you've accepted gifts, um, Mm -hmm. and you don't want it, you don't want to have to make such Mm -hmm. a big deal out of it because you are human. How do you ultimately resolve it? Like, how do you determine whether you accept or whether you don't, or have you had gifts that you haven't accepted? I have. I mean, I think... I, I, ha- I mean, I guess, you know, I have not had the experience of someone really coming to me with an extravagant gift. Um, and, it, I, you know, I I want to give a clearer answer than this, but, I, you know, I think the answer is that it depends, right? That if it depends on, I always try to talk about it at least a little bit, and maybe we have kind of a shared language around it. I would say you know, usually people understand, though I think I've hurt people's feelings in the past. Um, Definitely as a resident, I'm thinking about a particular time when I was just kind of like, I can't accept this. And the person was pretty crestfallen. Mm -hmm. Um, And we, you know, we were able to talk about it to a certain extent, but I also think that that gift refusal can be shaming. And that's a really tough emotion to come back from and definitely one that I kind of want to avoid at all costs with people. Mm. Um, and so the times I've accepted it is is often um, if I think it's heartfelt, if I think, I don't know, I you know, I guess I what I try to make sure about is does this seem like a manipulation? Um, was a person trying to make up for something? I guess if, you know, if I want to I want to figure out if there is something to talk about that we can put our finger on. But if it really seems like, no, it's the holiday season and this is a nice gesture of goodwill because you've helped me, then I probably don't press it. Yeah, you don't have to make a big deal out of it. Yeah, for better or worse, right? I mean, and sometimes it's almost like, haha, you know, we're going to have to talk about this, like, (laughs) especially if somebody has known me. It's more shared experience that way. Yeah, like, you know me. (laughs) This is what we got to do. Yeah, I, um, 
the things that I have accepted have been very easy for the patient to articulate the meaning behind or the symbolism behind it. Yeah. You helped with this and this now is a, like I was able to- and it's represented. Yeah, that. I was able to do this thing because of the work we did. Mm -hmm. And now this is a mm -hmm. token of how I was able to accomplish that goal. And so there may not be a lot of, um, I mean, the monetary value may be kind of low, but the emotional value is so high. Or a handcrafted item, and I guess I have to be yeah. careful here. I'm not, so I'm not talking about um, fine art on the marketplace or being sold. I just mean a person mm -hmm. who has handicraft, who doesn't sell it, mm -hmm. who does it for in the in the sense of gifts. Um, you know, who's who's created something. The only thing I've refused is when people want to just pay over my standard rate, which. I'm sure to business people that sounds crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, like I can't take a tip. Yeah, I've had. I mean, cash tips. I, maybe I waited tables. Uh, yeah, it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, and back to your, but to your point, yeah, I mean, there and there have been times when you're right that the the meaning is so clear and that I am genuinely moved, and then I don't, then I don't think we necessarily have to talk about it so much to dilute or achieving that experience, right? Like it needs to be acknowledged. Like I still think it's important, but, you know, in a sense of connection and, and gratitude, like I, you know, I, it's kind of a nice moment. Yeah. And that is, you know, to be pop culture-y in an obnoxious way, that is, that is people's love language sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I'm laughing because I'm. You can cut that out. No, but no, I mean, I'm thinking, but I, truly. no, it makes me wonder should we do should we do an episode on the love languages? <laughs> we should. Well, okay, maybe not a maybe not a whole episode <laughs> about love languages. Um, but but I guess the point is right that it comes in the context of the person and the context of my relationship with that person. Yeah. And that you know those things are an opportunity to explore probably as much as anything else. So it's not like I say at the beginning of treatment, like never bring me a gift. <laughs> right. So, I mean, another type of boundary crossing, or I would say more, more accurately boundary violation, meaning that it's pretty much never okay, that I want to bring up is sexual relationships. I think outside of this story, that's probably the type of boundary violation that gets the most press and the most attention for good reason. Um, the American Psychiatric Association would say that once someone is your patient, you are never to have a dating or sexual relationship with them later. In, in addition to that, the case or cases of people who I've known or known about who have had sexual relationships with their patients, there was a slippery slope or at least a leading up to that someone who thinks maybe that the rules don't apply to them or is willing to lie or cheat in different ways, maybe not sexual ways, um, and that when this big event happens and the person gets caught, then everyone looks back and says, you know, oh yeah, they were an, an unethical person in all these other ways, even if, you know, the sexual stuff wasn't on the horizon. And so I guess kind of what, what I'm putting out there, postulating right now, is that for some of these people, maybe like Dr. Ike, they don't set out to exploit or manipulate another person, but that over time it gets it gets easier and easier or the 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 depth of the exploitation gets deeper. Yeah. I mean, I I thought you were gonna say when somebody commits that level of a boundary violation, they're probably people that violate boundaries all the time in lesser ways. Yeah. Is that what you said? I mean, that's what I was... Well, I, I think that's another way to say it. I mean, I guess I... Like, I don't know that it's surprising. Yeah, it's, like, in retrospect, I don't think it's, it's never... Not, it's not necessarily surprising. Um, well, but, but I guess I think that sometimes people act like one type of boundary violation is is worse than another. Or someone could be, you know, financially exploitative or emotionally or whatever, but like once they c cross the line into a sexual violation, then that is completely different. I don't think that's true. I mean, it's like if you think about domestic violence people, it's like, well, you know, throwing objects is the step before hitting a person, mm -hmm. right? That there's 
that these things are related. And I think all the boundary crossings are, you know, probably on a similar continuum. So I guess there's a question of like, is is this a, a slippery slope or is a boundary violator always a boundary violator um, is maybe one question. And then maybe my other question is about intentionality. Well, there's always a lot of anecdotes where doctors mm-hmm. and patients get married and I don't really know that there were a lot of consequences. Right. And and then they all, you know, the couple always comes back and then it was the best thing ever. And there was no, I mean, so part of the difference. And it's like, well, in this, and in this one case, you know, this person was the love of my life. And what was I supposed right, to do? Right. When your soulmate walks into the office door, <laughs> how can you resist? Um, sure. I think the difference is whether the person who has now been exploited detects their exploitation. I mean, um, uh, like it's only a, it seems like it's only a problem if the victim recognizes it as a problem because otherwise it's not going to be talked about. I, I think with the podcast, mm-hmm. the journalist, um, there's several updates. So there's six initial episodes and then there are some updated ones giving you an advancement of the case and, and other people mm-hmm. that have c- come forward to talk to the journalist about their experience. Um, we don't know a lot of details, yeah. but the journalist suggests that there are other people who have experienced uh, mm-hmm. the relationship with him like that. So, And now he's suing Bloomberg. Did you see that? No, I didn't. Yeah. For, ba- for I guess he got fired and then he says they're not paying him um, justly for the proceeds of the Apple TV show. Oh, so I think that's, I did see that. I saw that he was upset that he wasn't getting mm-hmm. enough, I don't know, royalties or, or whatever. Yeah, but there's a lawsuit. Okay. But here's what I think is so ironic about that is the story. So he reports the story. I guess he gets to option it mm-hmm. off for a television show. Um, but the story mm-hmm. is actually Marty's. It's kind of like another right. example where Marty gets exploited again by the journalist who tells a story who then cashes in on it. No, this is a good point. This is a good point. All right. Well, should we pivot to the television show? Uh, if we have to. What? So you don't like it at <laughs> no. all? No. Like what? I mean, I... It was so okay. boring. Let me... Yeah. I know. So I'm going to agree. I'll jump to my conclusion, which I agree that the real story is way better than the fictionalized story. Indeed. And so if you if you saw the TV show, you still may enjoy the podcast. If you haven't done anything and you only wanted to invest a little bit of time, I would do the podcast and not the television so show. So that, that's, my, that's my summary. But so boring. Do you have any other critiques? I mean, boring. It made, like we said already, it made the doctor seem like an evil scheming villain and maybe he's just evil. I don't know. Um, well, so, and this is, as you know, this is my thesis, right? Because to me, the writers weren't able to imagine how the exploitation could have happened without him being, you know, a mustache twirling, greedy individual intent on harming or intent on abusing him. I guess that's it. And I think they, yeah. yeah, and I think they miss the whole point. I mean, in my mind, mm-hmm. it's like, no, he doesn't have to be those things. He may be those things. I don't know, but he doesn't have to be those things. And I think, yes, and that that's, yes, that is why I think it was boring in that there are, as you outlined at the top, so many great scenes and wild examples, right? He has him reenact his bar mitzvah. He builds a putt-putt course in the back, you know, Dr. Ike has an alias. Like, it's insane. I, you know, I, yes, it's yeah. completely. And yet they are able to make it boring because I think the characters don't have any depth. I mean, I guess it's like stunt casting, you know, Paul Rudd, sexiest man alive, the most adorable man in America or whatever, <laughs> is, you know, <laughs> supposed to be this evil manipulator. And then Will Ferrell is this kind of bumbling, spineless idiot. I don't know. I mean, it's just, it feels like it could be good. I mean, I think the tone is weird. I think you expect those two guys to be funny, but they're not funny, but they're also not serious. I don't know. It's like a character of so many things. Yeah. Like they they were going for psychological thriller, but there's nothing thrilling. And and I would even say that the there's this one scene where Marty, I mean, he's had enough and he destroys all this stuff in, in, a, in a montage, of course, mm-hmm. you know breaking the basketball goal. They put that in the trailer even. And I don't think that's really true to his character. And it's not true to the tone of the entire piece. And nothing happens from it. It's not like there's a transformation. 
Um, I mean, I guess eventually he confronts him and that's what they're calling the, the transition point. I, I also think they made Marty more pathological yeah. than the podcast, the, the factual information. They made him, you didn't get to see the part for very long about what he enjoyed about the relationship. Right. You only saw him as chronically dysthymic. And like once giving high fives because he flirted with somebody or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. He's 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 comically inept. Yeah. Though I mean it's very and condescending to Marty in general, I think. It is, yeah. And Catherine yeah. Hahn, who I think can do anything and is one of my favorite actresses, I feel like she didn't have anything to do and they didn't give her any motivations, right? As the sister who cared about Marty and sent him to the psychiatrist in the first place. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's messy. It, the whole thing is messy. And not fun messy. And not fun, no. The other part, so the podcast, because it's told from Marty's perspective, we then get to see how Marty perceives Hirschkopf. Yeah. We get to we get to hear the idealization. Mm-hmm. Um, we get to hear how he wanted to be like that. I mean, he talks about in the podcast, he talks about this picture of Dr. Ike and and Brooke Shields or somebody. Right. And, just his description of it. I mean, you can tell he just, he's in awe. And, you know, it's actually his sister in the podcast that says, she's a model. She knows how to look good in a picture. Right. Like, she doesn't care about this goof. She's at a benefit dinner. She leans over because it's expected that she takes pictures with the guests. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of it. But yet you get to hear Marty's telling of it, which is so much more moving than than what they gave us in the in the movie. Yeah, they, did, it, they didn't make it a believable relationship outside of the the exploited part of it. Yeah, because Paul Rudd as Ike is so cringeworthy that it then makes it so that you can't believe how Marty could have a relationship. Unless he's just insane. And, right. right. Unless he's like so yeah, sick. Yeah. And they make right. his abuse of Marty without subtlety at all. Yeah. I mean, the withholding affection and the gaslighting and the, um, I mean, then the dramatic dropping off another patient in the middle of nowhere at a gas station and orchestrate it all. I mean, again, they needed him to be so evil, but all that did was then distance them as far as like, well, if he's that evil, why was, uh, again, how did Marty get so wrapped up in it? I don't know. Right. It makes it harder to empathize with Marty. They try to make us empathize with Dr. Ike initially. Like they try to write a backstory for him and about his father issues and not being good enough. And and then there's the tension with the money and wanting to um yeah. uh wanting to um finally arrive, like to have mm-hmm. to have things mm-hmm. that others have or to like be a big man. Which again in the podcast, I did not get that sense at all. It sounds like he's like, hey, I have a lot of money. He was like first um, in his class at NYU med school. Like he yeah, his fine. his rates in the eighties were higher than my rates now. I I'm really saying, I know, right? But like, come on, like, yeah. I mean, inflation should count. Yeah, for I think something. he was probably doing all right. I think he was doing all right. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. The only probably character I had any empathy for was uh, Ike's wife, but you know, again, just because she was sort of a minor player. And and for our listener that that maybe hasn't seen it, the podcast, we don't know anything about his wife. So, I mean, what an interesting speculation that could be. As far except as, that she gets a house left to her. We know she gets a house and we know according to Marty, she does attempt to contact him um, mm-hmm. after the breakup. But yeah, we know nothing about her. And so you wonder as a witness to all this, what must she have been thinking? Right. But you know, again, in the in the TV show, they give her she plays a role, but I nothing happens to her. Nothing I mean, happens to her, is, but I'm just but she just seems sort of exasperated with her husband, which I can relate to that. That's all I got. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I meant being exasperated with with, with Ike. I mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. right, right. I don't know. It was, I, I wanted it to be good. I thought it could be good. I thought the podcast was so good. And like we said, surprisingly entertaining. I did not know that I needed more psychiatrist content in my life, but I did. I know who knew. And then, yeah. And then it, this just let me down. So I, I had a couple of like just really nitpicky things. You know, right. one, there was so much of the specific things that I did Mm -hmm. that they didn't include. And then they just made up some other things, at least in terms of allegations. I mean, I think like the Swiss bank account, um, I mean, that's wild. It's wild. That's not even like, that's not even upon your death. I'll get all your money. It's like, no, I have access to this money now. Uh I mean, I guess you could argue, well, he didn't spend, he didn't spend this Swiss bank account. You know, I don't know. Maybe he was playing a long game. What a saint. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought it was weird that the actors, their accents would drop out. Oh, it was often. bad. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. And there was a lack of subtlety. Yes. So there's a scene where um, Marty 
is uncertain of what to do. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that that's the scene. So he slams on the brakes, turns the car around, slams on the brakes, turns the car. I mean, he does it like. I mean, it's it's so. Uh, what do you? What's the word for that? <laughs> like, is that the only way to communicate his uncertainty? Ham-fisted? Like it seems comical. I don't know. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Well, I'm sorry to say that the podcast is now, and it, this was not the case when we decided to record this episode. It was just free, like all. Oh like no! Most I didn't know that. It's yeah. So now it's behind the Wondery paywall, and I think that's all related to the movie coming out Mm -hmm. and then wanting to get more money and an increased interest in it. So I hate that, but I will say it looked like there's a seven day free trial on Wondery. Just make sure you, you know, cancel if you don't want to listen to all of it because it's really good. Yeah. You can listen to it. I think it's maybe four hours. Yeah. Cause it's okay. Right. Because to your point, it's such a good story, right. With all these big scenes and wild details and there is a lot of room to fill in the gaps, right. About these people's motivations and sometimes you hear voices or at least actors reading their actual correspondence or thing, you know, like like things that that kind of give it a little bit more texture. And then somehow this TV show just dropped all that. Yeah. If you do go into Wondery, just, you know, make sure you look up call the psychiatrist too. Maybe um, you know, press like that and little... subscribe. Is that what they say? That's right. That's what we say. Yeah. This sounds like a good segue. Like and subscribe. Is this ticket to take us out. I can do it. Bring what do you it. think? All right. So listen, we want to thank everybody for your time. Thank you. Um, we have a need and we have a few wants. We really need your questions or your topics that you want us to cover. We, we actually want this show to be shaped by you. And if you don't get more questions, I'm going to be talking about presidential politics of the 60s. <laughs> I'll have no other recourse. We're going to have to rebrand. Um, I don't know how the, how the unicorn fits in with Dave's history lessons, but we'll have to work that out. <laughs> yeah. We, we want you to tell several friends about the show or tell your social media connections about the show. Um, and if you still, after, all, after you've done all that, if you still want to help us out, give us a rating and write a review on whatever app you're using to listen to the show. Um, that confers social proof so that others may consider listening to it if they happen to stumble upon the podcast. And then you can get a sticker. Get a sticker. Yeah, get your sticker. Like, come come join us and get a sticker. Um, as I said before, you can connect with us on Instagram or Facebook. And we have a website called thepsychiatrist.com where you can send an email. You can actually leave a voicemail right there on that website. It makes it really convenient. So until next time, take care. <laughs> <laughs>